Hi, welcome back. Everyone is uh, slowly returning. I had a hard time uh, uh, trying to uh, tear myself away from my very interesting uh, discussion partners. And um, we are asking everyone to uh, um, to to go to the menti.com and uh, pound in your key takeaway because we will try to be participatory and inclusive in uh, also in in our final uh, reflections on um, on this session. Um, but in the meantime, I might uh, I <laughs> I prepared him a little bit, but uh, I've uh, I've designated maybe Nina first and then Paul Engel who was part of my discussion can share some of the key takeaways uh, in our group but Nina you uh, how was the, how was the discussion in your room well it's I'm not sure if it was a coincidence but I was with two of my colleagues from Wageningen University so we had a very nice chat about uh, how important power is in in our work <laughs> um, but I actually asked my two uh, participants to share their key message. I'm not sure if that's... Uh, no, yeah, that okay? go yeah. ahead. Yeah. So we had first Faustina. Great. Okay, so um, the, one of the key takeaways from the group discussion is the fact that power is indeed important in our research. But sometimes we are often consuming in, in the dominant narrative of vulnerable groups. And so we often overlook that those that we consider as vulnerable also have some sort of power. Mm -hmm. And then we should pay attention to the fact that power is a relational concept and there isn't only one source of power. So we should pay attention to the specific ways that the vulnerable groups also exercise power rather than going in with interventions to, all, to sort of boost up their power without yeah. tackling the, the power dynamics in the relationship between actors. Very good, the hidden power and, uh, and trying to see that also, very interesting. Yeah, and actually we had a second key message, if I'm allowed, or is that the- No, no, go uh, ahead. Yeah. That was Peter's going to share that one, so. Yeah, okay, so uh, we discussed, we started basically discussing the previous uh, interventions and one of the con uh, conclusions that we draw is that there's a lot of interest in bringing everyone together, all stakeholders, and come up with a long-term plan to, to realize a change. Uh, but uh, in the end, all context change and social systems are very uh, flexible and, and variable. So it's more important to pay attention to reflexivity and to learning rather than on consistency and long time um, strength in achieving the, uh, the set goal at the beginning. So building in these moments to reflect together is a is, is yeah because in any long term uh, process there will be changes there will be uh, learning opportunities and if you stick to the initial goal that that you had to achieve then you will probably uh, run into difficulties uh, and uh, it's more important to be flexible which is also uh, of course uh, a comment on on donors and their consistency on uh, as, as defining outcomes at the beginning the famous log frames um yeah let's let's try to to leave that behind us and can convince uh, funders to do so we are almost running out of time so i'm going to give the floor to caro maybe in the meantime uh, participants can uh, can fill in your the key takeaways we of course have your sticky notes uh, for reference so nothing will be lost uh, so let's give the floor to caro before uh, she also uh, um, so that she has enough time to to give our reflections caro yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so some of this, what I'm going to say is, uh, is prepared be, uh, based on the uh, study report and uh, uh, the information I collected within the ministry. And some of it is kind of off the cuff based on what we just learned. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, uh, it may come across as a, a little bit uh, scattered. Um, maybe to start with um, a reflection on what I learned uh, in our group and what was just shared. So I don't have the full uh, Mentimeter overview of all the um, key takeaways, but uh, I think overall um, it's great to see the interest in a systems approach. Um, it's a little bit <laughs> at the same time, uh, I think, you could say systems approach is hot. Uh, like we 
who once in a while within development cooperation, if you're in it long enough, you recognize this. Um, we all of a sudden learn, which is great because the whole point is that we learn. So we learn, we get new insights and we come up with uh, new approaches because we know from experience, we need to improve on the way we uh, implement programs and design them, etc. So that's the positive side of it. Maybe as a, as a caution, um, this is also not going to solve all the problems. Um, so taking a systems approach, we need to be realistic. We have been doing stakeholder analysis forever. Um, what is different about the systems approach? Uh, it is probably that the way we looked at the stakeholders, and this also comes out of the research, of course, first of all, the stakeholders that we look at uh, are uh, are biased, let's say, by the implicit narratives that we have on the system. So the choice of, of stakeholders depends on that. That's great to, to realize that so that you can also ask somebody else, who do you think the stakeholders are? So that's great. Uh, comes out of the study is what we need, this insight. Um, then uh, to, to involve the stakeholders, how do you then involve them? And what do you want to learn from them? So this whole systems analysis that we talk about is very much about the, uh, as was just mentioned, the power as a relational concept. I really like this because that's what it's all about. What's the relation between the stakeholders? Where lies the power or perceived power uh, today? Where did it lie in the past? Where will it lie in future? All these questions around the power dynamics between stakeholders. That's what systems approach is about, whether it's for a food system or an economic system, any system basically. Um, so then how do, you, how do you internalize that in, in your everyday work? Uh, I think what we see is that we, that we have had these insights also in other areas, for example, uh, environmental, environmentally positive programming, as we call it now. Uh, it needs to be sustainable. We've always used the term sustainable, but we are really, really uh, doing a much better job on eco ecological uh, sustainable programs. But you have the same for conflict sensitivity, for example. We need to be aware of conflicts, potential conflicts, uh, do no harm or do good, etc. So there are all these different elements of this very complex uh, context that you work in that, that get attention at a certain point and then we agree it's important and then we call the programming X sensitive. So in this, in this way, you could also say that maybe we need to do system sensitive programming. And for that, we have seen when it's related to gender sensitive programming or conflict sensitive programming or environmental sensitive programming, we usually ask for guidelines then what does it mean? How do you do it? If you want to do system sensitive programming, uh, we need some guidelines, we need some practices uh, that, that worked in a certain context that may work also in our context. We need tools, etc. So I think that side of this whole discussion uh, could be very interesting also in terms of next steps and, and how do we uh, actually uh, implement these new insights and these new ideas. Um, I think for that, moving on to what, what it is that we need, and this is also very much in line with, with one of the Dutch priorities for the Food Systems Summit, is that we are interested in this interface between science and policy, between research, uh, experience, best practices, uh, lessons learned, and their translation into policy, and then policy needs to be put in practice. So this interface between them, we call this a mechanism, uh, how to make sure that we do get the information that we need in order to do good systems approach. Uh, that's, that's one of the key messages uh, as the Dutch government that, that we are using for the uh, Food System Summit as well. Another one, it was mentioned uh, quite uh, often, is the multi-stakeholder analysis. So there is important, I think, also for us to realize when we say multi-stakeholder analysis, we need to be uh, aware that we could be biased when we talk about stakeholders, which stakeholders then to engage. So this is something that I take back actually from this session and, and the research back to the ministry in our preparation of the Food System Summit. Um, and then uh, lastly, it's about the national ownership of uh, food systems approaches, whether it's in the countries that we spend our development cooperation money in or is in the Netherlands itself. Uh, any 
government and society that wish to work on food systems analysis need to somehow enter into national dialogues. And there again, uh, who will be invited to the dialogue? At what level will you have the dialogue? Um, and I think it's important, and we have also seen this from the example in Rwanda, that um, formal dialogue is one thing, but an informal dialogue, which you organize, if you like, just by inviting somebody for a cup of coffee and just asking them, you know, what is, what is your view on your own career, for example, and, and how do you see your work, you know, evolve? And where do these type of programs fit in? There's also dialogue, but that's very different from the dialogue that we usually talk about. But it's as important in a systems approach because it's both formal and informal if you want to truly understand the narratives of the people uh, that are functioning in the system. And then last but not least, maybe uh, linking up to building back better, which is, uh, which is one of those terms that we're using also within the ministry. I think what's really interesting is that though we have learned that the systems change is not, maybe not even solely or not in the first place, a technical issue. It, is, it has to do with politics, political dynamics. It can be sparked by technical or technological innovations. We have seen with the COVID-19, for example, that digital trade, uh, which we have been talking about for ages, uh, is really coming up because people had to change their business practices because they couldn't do the trade the way they were used to in, in the physical sense. They had to shift to digital trade, um, which pushes um, niche actors and region, uh, regime actors uh, in the same direction. So sometimes, um, yeah, never waste a good crisis, uh, we sometimes say, uh, it can also push technical things, could also push systems change. So maybe for now, I'll stop here. Uh, if there are any questions, I'm really happy to take them. I know we are, uh, we are over our time. We are in the break. I know I'm looking at Leonard if we are allowed to. <laughs> to, uh, to I think uh, we can go on for uh, two minutes. Great. So then uh, if, if someone wants to, uh, to accept uh, Caro's invitation for questions or comments. Please do so. I think there's a lot of people. I saw that Nicole, yeah, I saw that Nicole posted uh, something in the chat. Maybe it's good to mention that, yeah, for those who don't know yet. Nicole, you Nicole. want to read out or share what you, what you wrote down? Well, thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so um, just recently we had a meeting of a community of practice on food systems with Dutch stakeholders and a few of our international uh, friends and partners. And it's about food, sy food system decision-making, a tool developed by Wageningen University and KIT Royal Tropical Institute. They have developed a tool for food system de decision-making, um, working with different embassies, tested that last year, and a revised edition of that tool has been discussed recently. And I just posted the report of that recent conversation in the chat for people to tap into. And I can imagine people working in embassies in this call uh, can also be informed about it because in fact, in the process proposed for decision-making, there's lots of elements in that uh, conversation on how stakeholders could be engaged and how you facilitate that and how can you also intertwine that with the different processes that people are involved in either for policy, policy cycles, or uh, also for organizations that develop their programs, uh, let's say in the field or with different groups. Uh, there could also be some intertwining of, of a nice decision-making process, including different stakeholders. Of course, there's not one silver bullet, but it's got elements that can yeah. be useful for you to use. Thanks. But okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, any other burning question or burning comment? And maybe just one on what Ka Caro said, and I completely agree that this uh, crisis uh, creates a lot of change and innovation, which we hope we'll still keep. But behind the technical innovation, there are always people because there's no technical innovation without users. So, for example, we learn a lot now about how to do all these global webinars. So I really hope we will have less global conferences uh, uh, next year and not go completely back to usual. And we cannot completely avoid all the conferences because you want to see people in person, but you can do a lot more than we, than, than we thought beforehand. So, uh, so I just wanted to, uh, I completely agree, but behind the technique is people because we often forget the, yeah. the people. 
and building on that and also learning a bit from from Paul uh, Paul's long trajectory in innovation thinking being aware of the um, uh, the winners and losers of technological innovations is also quite crucial so uh, nice uh, that we are all able to uh, link in but people with uh, with less uh, stable internet connections are missing out on a lot of interesting content in terms of conferences at the moment so we are happy that we have, we have been able to connect to uh, to Kigali uh, to India um, to all corners of uh, Brussels, Maastricht, uh, and 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 the uh, tropical islands, <laughs> um, and um, I invite you all to uh, to take a break and uh, and uh, get back to uh, to the conference. In nice drink, prost, prost. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you all so much. Maybe. And then we stick around a bit. <laughs> yeah. I, I just Fabian want to is still there. Hi, but... thanks for everything. I have to go to another meeting. Yeah, yeah maybe uh, maybe I try to reschedule or we can uh, we can yeah. converse over email what kind of uh, of follow up we can give oh, to we lost a lot of people I think in the in the breakout group. We only had we started with five, but two people were kind of they dropped out, so we only had like three left. So uh, that was uh, Yeah, we can you see that happening a lot, but that was yep. just, uh, yeah, but, but the discussion. Yeah, people was, are shopping. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> people are only shopping. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. guys. Thank bye you. Bye. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. Uh, wil je dat we, Paulina, wil je dat we blijven hangen nu voor de. Nee hoor, Karo. Wij gaan als, uh, als mini-team eventjes. Uh, Even nu kijken hoeveel mensen er überhaupt uh, zijn gekomen. Maar heel, heel erg bedankt voor je closing remarks. Heb je die ergens nog genoteerd dat ik ze makkelijk...